Five days after this trial started and the families of those murdered were in court to hear sentence. They'd already seen those responsible change their pleas from not guilty to guilty. Guilty of walking into the Rising Sun bar and opening fire on the crowds inside. Eight people died and eight people were injured. Stephen Irwin, filmed here after his arrest, shouted trick or treat before firing 44 shots from an assault rifle. At his side was Jeffrey Deeney. He fired one shot from a handgun before it jammed. Torrens Knight had stood guard outside. He was also given life sentences today for the murder of four Catholic workers in Castle Rock seven months before Grey Steel. Brian McNeil was the gang's getaway driver. He, like the others, received eight life sentences. The judge, Lord Justice Carswell, described the shootings as a callous, cold-blooded massacre which appalled and disgusted all right-thinking people in the community. He said in the scale of the barbarities over the last quarter of a century, it ranked very high. The judge said there was nothing in way of mitigation. For the families, though, there was anger afterwards because the judge had decided not to recommend a minimum number of years the men should serve. The judge should recommend a minimum sentence. They shouldn't deserve to see daylight again. I'm broken heart and I always will be. I've lost my husband and nothing will bring him back. And I'm as broken heart at the day as I was two years ago. The arms seized during the Grace Steel investigation were put on show today together with a frank admission by police that the terrorist foot soldiers had been caught but not those who'd ordered the killings. That most police in all investigations would acknowledge that they never get everyone that's involved and as has been the case in Northern Ireland godfathers are very difficult to locate and get. What is important is that in this instance we have the murder team but it's the judicial system the families feel let down by. They think the men could be released inside 15 years and they dismiss talk of remorse as a joke. Matthew Amreliwala, BBC News, Belfast. Cross-channel ferry services have been returning to normal tonight after French seamen ended their blockade of Calais. But the dispute over the use of cheap Polish crews by the British shipping company Meridian hasn't been resolved. And there have been further clashes between protesters and the police at Meridian's offices in Boulogne. As darkness descended on the port of Calais tonight, a welcome sight for passengers. The French seamen strike is over, for the moment at least, and the ferries are sailing again. The strikers had gathered this morning and decided to lift the Calais blockade. Their leaders have pleaded for moderation and claimed victory. But as yesterday, there was violence in Boulogne, where protesters started fires and tried to pull down barricades protecting the offices of the British ferry company Meridian. Riot police using tear gas forced them back. British ministers voiced their disapproval. What we've seen is French unions going completely over the top, putting people's personal safety at risk, firing flares, chucking bricks and so forth. Quite unacceptable. French seamen say Meridian is a threat to their livelihoods because it's hired Polish crews on cheap rates. The Poles are desperate for work after privatisation of fleets in Eastern Europe. But there's nothing illegal in what Meridian is doing. Meridian's own figures show big differentials in pay rates on channel ferries. Meridian employs able seamen from Poland on £5,000 a year. A British seaman would earn about 12000 and a French seaman, 22,000 a year. Meridian says French pay rates are far too high. The French seamen put themselves out of work. They're overpaid. Uh, they don't work the hours that other seamen are prepared to work. So that they're, uh, uh, it's their own fault, really. But Meridian believes it's become a pawn in what's really a French problem, saying it's an argument between French crews and their own national ferry company, which is trying to renegotiate their contracts of employment. The seamen's anger has been vented on Meridian and the British Seafarers Union can understand why. You have to remember that in the UK, within the last 15 years, 50,000 British seafarers jobs have disappeared, purely and simply as a result of companies flagging out and also employing foreign crews. Freight traffic across the channel is growing, but profit margins for freight are tight and all operators have to be competitive. The bad news for holidaymakers is that though the French government has today appointed a mediator, the dispute remains unresolved. John Fryer, BBC News. The Prime Minister has tonight attacked Scottish devolution as a Trojan horse. In a speech to be delivered in Glasgow shortly, he warns the Scottish people against sleepwalking into a decision which would damage Scotland. 
Welcome to a Glasgow fundraising dinner. Mr Majors tonight rejecting outright a Scottish Parliament. Labour's plans to give it power to raise income tax, 3p in the pound, he'll argue, would cost the average family £6 a week and wreck Scotland's prosperity. Aware of the contrast with his readiness to support a Northern Ireland Assembly, Mr Major cites vital differences. A significant minority in Northern Ireland wishes to be part of another country, the Irish Republic. There, the idea of an assembly offers stability and harmony, but no one in Scotland wants to leave the UK to be subsumed in a foreign country. But in Perth, where the government is facing its next by-election ordeal, the Scottish National Party challenges his claim that no Scottish Parliament is needed because Scots are represented by mainstream parties at Westminster and that there's not been 25 years of killing in their country. There's a huge contrast between John Major going to Northern Ireland, speaking like a statesman, and saying, let the people decide, and John Major coming to Scotland, speaking like a robot, and saying, I've already decided. Uh, and that is a contrast and a hypocrisy which the people of Scotland are not going to tolerate. As demonstrators keep their vigil for a Scottish Parliament, Labour's unrepentant about the powers it proposes to give it. Tax raising or tax cutting will be done at the behest of the Scottish people, and I don't see why any government, any Tory government, should set its face against that democratic choice. It never rains, but it pours. And on top of his Ulster problems and the Scottish backlash they've invoked, Mr Major's gambling his authority by leading for his party in next week's Europe debate. I see the debate next week as an opportunity to put right many of the misunderstandings that people have had about European policy, to make it clear where it needs to be made clear in the House of Commons what the government's policy is to Europe in the short term and the long term. But it's not only whipless Tory rebels, some of whom were today promoting a referendum bill, but other Conservative Eurosceptics too, who are demanding a new clarity as the price of support. I think it is very possible that a number of members of Parliament will vote against the government if we don't get the clarity on the single currency in principle that we want. On Europe, Mr Major can often do little but paint over his party's divisions. This time, after telling the Cabinet to stop squabbling, he's seeking to lay down a line behind which his party can group, if not exactly unite. In Scotland, he's positioning them as defenders of the Union, reckoning there's little point in being the fourth keenest devolution party. But opponents will continue to point up the contrast with his treatment of Northern Ireland. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Glasgow. The Manchester United footballer Eric Cantona has been disciplined by the Football Association following the incident last month involving a Crystal Palace supporter. The FA has banned him from playing until September the 30th and fined him £10,000 for bringing the game into disrepute. Manchester United say they consider the penalty harsh, but they won't appeal. By the very look of him on arrival, Eric Cantona was out to make the best possible impression, and during the three hours or so of submissions, this was clearly done. That the incident happened was not in dispute, but given that Cantona has been bailed to appear before a magistrate's court next month on a charge of common assault, today's hearing, with police approval, applied itself to the more general matter of whether the player had brought the game into disrepute. There was some delay between hearing and verdict, but when it came, £10,000 fine and a ban until the 30th of September, it seemed the FA had taken an understanding, if not lenient, point of view. The crowd's provocation, United's own prompt suspension and Cantona's <coughs> apology and assurances for the future were all taken into account. All Eric Cantona has suffered some considerable degree already and faces the prospect of further suffering, I don't think that he's got off lightly. The sight then of Cantona himself walking into the news conference raised expectations of hearing his first personal account of what happened. Instead, though, he sat in silence, prevented from speaking, it was said, by legal considerations, and thus leaving the floor to the club lawyer. There's a sense, isn't there, in which Eric Cantona has to leave today as a reformed character. Does the club have confidence in that? Yes, I think we have. Mm. Well, I've spent quite a bit of time with him over these last few weeks. And obviously we have talked about this situation and I believe that he, he, he will do his best. I think that's also the confidence of uh, Mr Ferguson as well. Manchester United expressed their disappointment with the verdict, but it clearly allows the club to hope that Cantona will stay at Old Trafford. That clearly was the wish also of the fans there this afternoon. He's such a good player and I don't think, I don't think he deserved it, but it's not as bad as a lifespan. So I'm happy. I feel he's been treated 
quite badly actually because I think the ban for the end of the season was 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 harsh enough. I think to be banned for for another month as well, probably six to eight weeks as well because of August. I think he's been treated quite badly. As long as he plays again, I don't mind. No, not the same really. Questions remain though about whether Cantona can truly be the same player again. As crowds certainly and players perhaps attempt to provoke a further outburst. The self-restraint required may well dull the creativity. Ahead of Cantona then, seven months of training. Dull, laborious, unfulfilling. There's already been some transfer interest from abroad. There may be more. Expediency may yet mean that with regret, club and player part company. The Football Association also briefly touched upon the wider issue of abuse from spectators and revealed that it had been recently talking to the Commission for Racial Equality and leading politicians about the matter. Present legislation, it's felt, is insufficient to properly deal with what has become a disturbing feature of atmospheres at many English grounds. Rob Bonnet, BBC News, in St Albans. The spying row between France and America has escalated. The American Embassy in Paris has denounced the French Interior Minister Charles Pasqua over the affair, saying his version of events was untrue. Monsieur Pasqua had blamed the embassy for leaking details of how France asked Washington to recall five Americans from Paris for spying. At the American Embassy in Paris, private irritation has become public anger. Officials stepped outside the boundaries of diplomatic language to accuse the French interior minister, in effect, of lying. Charles Pasqua, blunt and pugnacious, has brushed aside suggestions that his officials leaked details of his row over spying to the press. American diplomats were responsible, he says. A charge the Americans dismiss as not true and not credible. Mr. Pasqua is a key ally of Edouard Balladur, the Prime Minister who is running for President. He is popular with the right wing of their Conservative Party, the RPR, but his support for Mr. Balladur now appears as much a liability as an asset. Many French voters believe details of the spy row were leaked to distract attention from a phone-tapping scandal in which both men are deeply involved. Industries like aerospace and communications have become battlegrounds for rival Western intelligence services in the post-Cold War world. This time, though, it is not just the usual scientific secrets at stake. In spite of this latest extraordinary exchange of allegations, France and the United States still clearly hope the diplomatic fallout from this affair can be limited. But it's clear there's been real damage to the relationship between the two governments. Kevin Connolly, BBC News, Paris. Here, a haulage firm, which is the main transporter of live animals for export through the port of Plymouth, has pulled out of the trade. Peter Gilder Hauliers of Gloucestershire blamed security problems and the cost of using the port for their decision. It effectively ends the export of livestock from Plymouth. Plymouth's Mill Bay docks tonight after three months of almost non-stop protests. Jubilant animal rights campaigners say the halting of livestock exports shows that here at least they've won the day. It's just a dream come true. It really is. That's all I can say. I don't think... I just really can't believe it as well. I, I, I want to pinch myself because I just can't believe the news. It's absolutely brilliant. The decision to end for the moment the livestock trade from Plymouth has been made by Peter Gilder Hauliers, a Gloucestershire-based firm. Since November, they've chartered a cargo ship to take veal calves and other livestock to France. They blame pulling out of the port on difficulties over security arrangements and the cost of using Plymouth. But farmers in the southwest say the export trade is not over with yet. At this point in time, I understand from one airfield, there are three planes on standby that can fly out over this weekend, and all three planes can carry 400 cars at any one time. But other livestock exporters are predicting immediate job losses. In Plymouth, meanwhile, for those who say they've stopped the trade, one huge street party is planned to go on all night. Madeleine Holt, BBC News, Plymouth. The former American president, Jimmy Carter, has returned to Haiti five months after negotiating the removal of its military dictator. He's been having talks with the president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, over the next... ...is planned to go on all night. Madeleine Holt, BBC News, Plymouth. 
The former American president, Jimmy Carter, has returned to Haiti five months after negotiating the removal of its military dictator. He's been having talks with the president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, over the next stage in the country's return to democracy. In March, United Nations troops will replace the 5,000 American soldiers who secured the handover. It's carnival season in Haiti, a time for high excitement as well as heightened tensions between the country's democratic leadership and supporters of the regime it replaced five months ago. Government officials have claimed the old guard have been using the preparations for Mardi Gras as cover for another plot to destabilize the country. And American soldiers have had to step up security just as Operation Uphold Democracy draws to a close. In spite of the latest scare, though, U.S. commanders say more than 30,000 weapons have now been seized or surrendered, and the situation is officially safe and secure. Haiti's president, however, is not convinced that the struggle for power in his country is over. He believes that many of those responsible for the reign of political terror during his years in exile are still at large and still a risk. It's safe enough to move from the first phases of the UN mission to the second one. But it's not safe enough to say we don't need any more to disarm those who have weapons. Jean-Bertrand Aristide came back to Haiti promising national reconciliation, justice and democracy. And the benefits of his return so far have been largely psychological. For in practice, little has changed. Power shortages, a chronic problem, are getting worse. Most areas receive electricity for an average of just one hour a day, while in the slum districts like Cité Soleil, unemployment and food prices are rising, even though the trade embargo is long gone. Yet for the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere, anything is better than what went before. At least now we can sleep safely at night, this woman says, although we don't have enough to eat, and Aristide promised us food and work. The nation's hopes for the future rest here at the internationally sponsored police academy, where a new generation is learning modern methods of policing, with classes in civil rights, criminal behavior, and most important, human dignity. Bill Turnbull, BBC News, Port-au-Prince. Councillors in Shropshire have defied the government by approving a budget £6 million over the legal limit. Shropshire is the fourth council to rebel against capping restrictions and all but one of its Conservative members supported the rebellion. They say it's time the government listened to Middle England. Bishop's Castle is a Shropshire market town close to the Welsh border. As the man who drives the only taxi here will tell you, it's already been battered by the recession. Over the years we've lost factories, we've lost pubs, shops. Uh, there is not more we can lose. This old people's home could be next to go. It's on a list of six council-run homes now under review. Kenneth Bell is among those fighting the closure. His wife has Alzheimer's disease and caring for her at home became too much. The complex itself is just absolutely wonderful. And I think it's disastrous if they close it. Other services are already on a shoestring. The library opens only twice a week. The fire station is manned by part-timers. It too faces an uncertain future. The local comprehensive school, which doubles as a community centre, has been told it could lose up to seven teaching jobs and its entire funding for adult education. The most insidious aspect of this is that if government policy doesn't change, then on top of this year's cuts, which are pretty crippling, uh, we stand to face two more years, and I don't see how we can possibly survive that. We shall be extremely lucky to survive this year. Today, a group from Bishop's Castle joined a march of 2,000 protesters through the streets of Shrewsbury, supporting the decision by county councillors to breach the government's cap limit. The move would add £45 to the average council tax bill here, but councillors believe it has public backing, and all but one of them voted to defy the government limit. It would be doing the government no service, whatever, if we help to nurture them in the, in the illusion that this, these protests aren't real, and I think they really have got. If, if, I think much of rural Shropshire epitomises what is called Middle England, and Middle England is angry, and they had better start listening. In, in defying, defying their, their cap, cap limit, councils are effectively, effectively throwing, throwing the ball, ball into the government's court. It will have to decide whether to uphold the cap or to allow councils some extra leeway, as has happened in the past. But continued defiance could prove expensive. It will mean issuing new bills, and if councillors persisted with an illegal budget, they could be surcharged. John Andrew, BBC News, Shropshire. 
Thousands of German engineering workers have walked out on strike in support of a pay claim. Twenty-two plants in the southern state of Bavaria have been brought to a standstill in the first major strike in the engineering sector for 11 years. Workers are demanding a 6% pay rise, but the employers say any increase must be linked to improvements in productivity. The civil war in Afghanistan has been transformed by the emergence of an armed Islamic student movement, the Taliban. They've destroyed the power of several of the country's warring factions, and the implementation of a United Nations peace plan has been postponed so they can be included. Afghanistan has been at war ever since the Soviet Union's intervention forces withdrew in 1989. The communist-led government was overwhelmed three years later by a coalition of Western-backed guerrillas. But these were unable to form a united government and split the country between them. Now the students of the Taliban have established themselves as the main opposition, challenging the ruling faction in Kabul. In just six months, the Taliban have seized a third of Afghanistan. By the standards of this long war, it's been a lightning advance. The Taliban say they're not like other groups of fighters here because they want peace, not power. The people believe them, and without having to fight a major battle, they're at the gates of Kabul itself. For the time being, the Taliban are observing a ceasefire. But that doesn't mean the fighting around Kabul has stopped. Every day, government forces are still taking on smaller opposition groups. For almost 16 years now, this country has been at war. First they fought the Soviet Union, then the communist government. For the last three years, they've been fighting each other. In this war-weary nation, the Taliban's talk of peace is almost revolutionary. It's changing the balance of power. <laughs> Today there is political hope and Kabul improves a little bit. So we are fearing that the people think, oh, so the problem is over. The problem remains. that The Kabul population suffers since over 20 years. They feel desperate and need outside support. Government troops on the front line outside Kabul don't know what to make of the Taliban, though they're confident they'd beat them if it came to a fight, which it hasn't yet. But destroying their own capital city is all the government and the other old opposition groups have managed to do in the last three years. Kabul was almost undamaged during the war against the Soviets. These ruins and the people who died in them are the worst indictment of Afghanistan's failed political leaders. The Taliban have been so successful so quickly because they say they want peace and most ordinary Afghans are sick of the war. But to take real power in this country, they'll probably have to fight. And if they become yet another faction in the Afghan civil war, they'll lose the public support that has been so vital. The people are still dying. At this funeral, they buried three members of a single family who were killed in a rocket attack. But Afghans are hoping that the Taliban won't end up like all the other guerrilla groups. For the first time in years, there's a little hope. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, Kabul. The actor Stephen Fry, who disappeared on Sunday, has faxed his agent, saying he left the country because of stage fright. Mr. Fry, who was spotted on a cross-channel ferry on Monday, had received poor reviews for his performance in the new West End play, Cellmates. The actor apologised to the play's cast and asked the press to allow him a little space and solitude. Ministers from the world's most powerful industrialised nations are meeting in Brussels to discuss how to develop the so-called information superhighway. Although European companies are developing some of the vital electronic technology, Many fear the Americans will dominate this multi-billion pound industry. Even in the most unlikely surroundings, Europe's information revolution is gathering pace. In this Amsterdam cafe, customers scan the electronic superhighway. The computers installed free by the local council, an attempt to ensure everyone has access. But despite such efforts, the continent has a lot of catching up to do. Picture yourself in our casual range. Choose from our colour. Home shopping is just one of the many services which will be available in future. Using the next generation of televisions, people will be able to order clothes electronically from their front rooms. But Dutch developer Philips worries its American rivals are ahead in the race to exploit the new technology. The more unity of purpose, there's a greater sense of urgency, like so often in America than in Europe.
And of course, the Americans see Europe as a very important playing field. European manufacturers know the Americans have invested heavily in the necessary hardware, helped by less tightly regulated telecommunications markets. At its factories, Italian firm Olivetti says there's a danger the United States will dominate the superhighway. We will have a period of decay, really decline in uh, the leadership which we still have on a world basis in many fields of activity. On the other side of the Atlantic, it isn't just the technology that Europe fears. American firms like Bell are developing a range of programs to deliver to homes. American films and shows will be available for people to watch when they want. Such a service would find a ready audience outside the United States too. Some argue Europe's culture could be endangered in the years to come. At a dinner in Brussels tonight, opening the G7 summit on the superhighway, the Europeans stressed their determination to prevent their culture being eroded. The Commission president said the continent had to have a strong industry. The choice is to be in the advanced party at the front, or to be nowhere and face astronomical catch-up costs in the future. Some exhibitors at this summit believe only import quotas will keep the Americans out. This is a lucrative business worth fighting for. Thousands of European jobs will depend on the outcome. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Brussels. And tonight's main news again. Four men have begun life sentences for the murder of eight people at the Rising Sun pub in Greysteel 18 months ago. Newsnight is on BBC Two at 10.30, but that's all from the 9 o'clock news. Have a peaceful weekend. Good evening. Animal rights protesters had been given a week to move on, but tonight the makeshift camp is still outside Coventry Airport. Today there were further clashes with the police and more arrests. 200 demonstrators tried to stop trucks carrying veal calves from entering the airport. Scuffles broke out as police tried to clear the way. Some demonstrators were detained and eight were arrested and charged with a number of offences including obstruction and affray. Warwickshire police intend to keep the front of the airport clear. Because the encampment is there blocking the grass verges, it actually means that other demonstrators uh, are actually demonstrating on the roadway and can't use the verges. Obviously that uh, causes a road safety danger to other road users and to the, the demonstrators themselves. And as we know, there's already been a tragic accident here and we want to avoid any further accidents. Today, the protesters ignored the deadline and a police warning that their property may be moved. Now the police will discuss with the local authority what action to take next in any further attempts to move the makeshift camp. The protest against council cuts switched to Shropshire today and it was the biggest protest yet seen in the Midlands. A thousand demonstrators took to the streets of Shrewsbury to support their county council's decision to become the second in the region to ignore government spending limits. Councillors, Tories included, set a budget £6 million above the government's recommended target. The Conservative MP Dame Jill Knight is this evening expected to announce that she's stepping down at the next election. Dame Jill has been the MP for Edgbaston in Birmingham since 1967. It's understood she's telling her constituency association the reasons for her decision tonight. Well, that's it. Do join us from 5.15 tomorrow afternoon, if you can, for all the news and sport. For now, though, have a very good weekend. Clive Anderson continues his tour of holiday trouble spots on BBC Two now. This week, he's our man in Cuba. Oh, but couldn't you cope with that climate, eh? But we have our own, and that's dealing us some more wet weather at the moment. It's not particularly wet, but you'll notice since uh, late this afternoon there's a band of rain stretching from Ireland right the way across down towards London. It's pulsating, but basically it's hitting this area rather damp. Now there are showers further north. These are mainly, but not entirely, of snow. A lot of cloud around, but that's definitely the showery pattern. This is less distinct, and you can see it's a fairly complicated picture. But it does resolve itself to some degree in uh, giving us rather damp weather for much of southern England and Wales, with increasingly wintry showers the further north you go. Now, this cloud isn't going to stop it going down to frost levels. Anywhere in northern England, you could see about three, in it's rather damp.
of weather for much of southern England and Wales, with increasingly wintry showers the further north you go. Now, this cloud isn't going to stop it going down to frost levels. Anywhere in northern England, you could see about zero degrees, and icy patches are a risk, or especially maybe in Scotland, although, of course, the snow is quite welcome for the ski resorts. We're doing very well this weekend. This is Saturday's chart. A complicated affair still, but again, I think it works out something like this. The cloud through the Midlands and East Anglia, back through Wales, outbreaks of rain on it, mostly light, some sleet or snow, maybe in Snowdonia, and the Peak District, i.e. the northern edge. To the north of that, it's generally fine. A good deal of sunshine in the east, more likely to have showers in the west, and they're going to be heavier, I think, than today, with a chance of thunder. Certainly most of them will be snow on, on the high ground. Now, as the day goes on, the breeze will pick up to some degree, and many of those showers will come across from the west to the eastern side. Not all, but some will. The hint also is that that cloud further south might break up to some degree. Well, it might, but I think like today we'll see brighter rather than sunny weather. We'll see showers getting across to the east coast, though. Temperatures similar to today's, and with the northerly breeze in, in the west, it's not going to feel very warm. We're about the right level now for February. There's Sunday's chart. It's a northerly. That usually brings wintry showers and cold weather. Well, it's going to do just the same this time as well. The showers probably draped around the east and west coast, particularly over northern Scotland. Substantial snow is likely on the hills there, but anywhere inland in England, in Wales, and probably in Ireland, we'll see some good sunshine. But the temperatures aren't that high. Enjoy your weekend. Good night. A battle of wills. Get some fight back into you. Save our industry. And a struggle to survive. Harry Salter, News Associates. Do you think you deserve this? Hot on the trail. It took a nose for a good story, perseverance, and a great talent. And playing with fire. There's got to be a story, even if it's not the one they want to tell us. You've got your own story before you've talked to me. I should have known. We'll go all the way if we need to. I doubt it. Harry, Wednesday, 9.30 on BBC One. Performing for the boys in 50 minutes, Bette Midler and James Kahn as a pair of entertainers putting on a show for the troops at conflicts from World War II to Vietnam. First on B uh, BBC One, a professional blunder spells trouble for police surgeon Paul Dangerfield.